Hello, hello everyone. The first Monday of 2022. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. This is Dr. B with College and Career Conversations with Dr. B. You're going to get a different uh, take this evening. So I decided, you know what? It's the first Monday, the first College and Career Conversations of the year 2022. And I'm going to make this one all about me. So for those of you who don't know me, and for those of you who do, you'll get to see, uh, you'll get to hear some more information about me, how I came to be Dr. B. What was my educational and career journey like? Um, I love, I'm glad that I had, you know, pictures of different events over the years. So I plan to share that with you. But I want to wish everyone a happy new year. And I also hope that this brings you peace, joy, and good health this year. So stay tuned. We'll be back in a few seconds. So as I was saying earlier, um, Today's, I am your guest. I am the one who you are getting to do uh, here an informational interview with. So for those of you that join in, please, I, I'd love to hear your comments, your questions as we go along. Uh, I was having a conversation earlier with a friend um, earlier this week, um, actually a couple of weeks ago, and we were just talking about, we were just kind of doing a review of all the things that we've done throughout our lives and just looking back over the last couple of years, because we know for everyone, the last couple of years have been really crazy. Um, and I kept thinking, you know, okay, I, I'm working on my guest list. Who am I going, you know, who am I going to invite and ask and, and what have you? And someone said, well, why don't you be your own guest? You know, give people an opportunity to learn who Dr. B is and how you came to be Dr. B. And I said, well, that feels like that's a little self-indulgent. But then the more I thought about it, I said, you know, one of the things I'm working on is celebrating me and honoring me and respecting the work I do and seeing the value in what I do. Because you know that sometimes that we can be our own worst critics. And so I just decided, you know what? I'm going to talk about Dr. B today. Hey, Kim, thank you so much. I'm glad that you're here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about me today. And, and because sometimes I get to start rambling on and what have you, I had to, you know, have some slides just so I could make sure that I stay on track and, and don't get crazed and all, all over the place with my words. Um, this was important to me too, because I think about the people who have supported me um, throughout my life and definitely in this last career transition. But in particular, I think about my mom who very early on recognized that um, I loved learning and made sure that I had every opportunity to learn. Um, so this is dedicated to the late Irene Lily Williams. Mom, this one's for you. Ah, Kelly, thank you so much. So I am going to uh, try to share this screen and we'll see what happens here. And we will get this started. So as you can see, I got a little really self-indulgent. You know, it's all about me, Dr. B's career journey in pictures. It's funny when you start looking through old albums and stuff. Yes, some of us still have albums. This is when I was still printing out pictures. I've got to print out some more. I said, wow, you know, here's, here's some stuff about me. So I, I really wanted to look because most of the time, you know, because I work with high school students, this is geared toward, you know, from high school on. But my journey didn't start at high school. You know, it definitely started earlier. But this is kind of where we're going to pick up. So I attended Central High School in Providence, Rhode Island. So that that's home. And just a few pictures here. So, so this one always makes me laugh. I think this one was in 10th grade. Um, that dress I have on was actually a dress I made in home ec in um, eighth grade. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, you can see I was a little, little on the skinny side there. You can see some of the hairdo. So we're really kind of dating ourselves. You can see in the yearbook pictures, you know, the guys have on their, um, their shirt and ties because, you know, back in the day, that's what we did. We always had, you know, shirt and ties. Um, this is junior prom. Yes, junior prom. This is my date was on um, Florentino Martinez. 
uh, pretty cool guy. You know, we were good friends. Uh, again, those home ec skills, you know, kids don't have home ec these days. It's crazy. These home ec skills made my dress. Yes. Um, I would love to be able to fit in that dress today, but we know that's not happening. Um, so again, this is also my graduation picture. Back in the day, graduating from Central High School class. Yes, I am going to date myself. I, you know, I am proud of every year that I have because I've earned every year. Um, this is class of 1971 from Central High School. Yes, that is me. Didn't have glasses on, even though I wore glasses because I was too busy trying to be cute, but I couldn't see a thing. Okay, so let's move on. Now, I always tell the kids they really need to be interested in doing extracurricular activities. So I had a few extracurricular activities. As I started looking around, I said, oh, yeah, I did a few things here and there. So this is actually, I think this is 10th grade or 11th grade. I'm not really sure. But I was a member of the tutoring club. So this is the picture that we, you know, pose for, for the yearbook. But that was one of the things I got to do. And this was one of my friends, Donna Gurton. God, I haven't seen Donna in like forever. Um, the other thing, I wanted to be a cheerleader so bad. God, I wanted to be a cheerleader. You know, I was athletic. I could do the splits and all that stuff. But our cheerleaders did like these dance routines and if you, have, you know, I, you know, I'm not that great at those routines. So the first year I tried out for cheerleading during my junior year, I did not make the squad. I was hot broken. You hear me? Oh my God, I was so hot broken. But I made sure that I went and practiced and practiced and learned the routines and just worked more on my splits and all that other stuff. So senior year basketball and football cheerleader. Yay, go Central. Yes, those were our uniforms back in the day. Um, they do not look like that today. But again, you know, that's what they were back in the 70s. Um, at after school jobs, I had to work. You know, my mom was a single mom and uh, there were three kids at the time, four eventually. So I had after school jobs as a babysitter, a factory worker, that factory job made me realize that there was no way that I was not getting an education. Rhode Island used to be the costume jewelry capital. Providence actually was like the costume jewelry capital of, of the United States, I guess. We had Monet and Spidel and all these other um, jewelry companies there. So one of my first jobs was working in a jewelry factory as a foot press operator. So that's when, so remember when everyone always wore clip on earrings, you know, that pierced earrings really weren't a thing back in my day. Um, so my job was to put the two little pieces together for the clips into this machine and then press this, this foot press and clip them together. Oh my God, monotonous, horrible, awful, everything. I said, okay, I cannot be doing this the rest of my life. So that didn't work. Then I had a job as a teacher's assistant when I was in high school, which was so cool. One of my school counselors, Mr. Hamlin, and you'll see a picture of him later, um, he knew that I wanted to be a teacher. So he just made sure that he was always looking out for me and stuff. So he told me about this wonderful job working for this couple where they were looking for someone to correct their papers. So they were basically multiple choice papers. So they were looking someone to correct their paper. And they lived in my neighborhood. They lived maybe like uh, four blocks from me. So I said, great, great. So it was a fantastic job. So after school, I'd go over to um, these folks' house a, a few times a week and they'd give me a stack of papers and the answer key. And it was my job just to, you know, check off the answers and grade them and what have you. That was wonderful until I decided I wanted to critique their lessons. They weren't too thrilled about that. So needless to say, after I started critiquing the lessons, they decided that they no longer needed my services. So so much for learning how to do that. And then I was a hospital worker. So my, actually it was the year, um, the summer after my senior year and I had a, a position working in um, Rhode Island Hospital. So there was a program that was designed to help um, low income students get, uh, get summer jobs. And it just happened that all the summer jobs were in Rhode Island Hospital. I was fortunate in that my friend and I were assigned to work in the emergency room. That was absolutely amazing. 
I mean, we saw things that we never thought we would see again, but it also convinced me that medical, um, the medical field was not my forte, but it was so interesting. And we just learned so many great skills in doing that job. So I think it's important that kids always go back and not just kids, adults too. Think about who the teachers are that made a difference in your lives. Um, I was so fortunate to have some teachers who really, really um, poured into me and helped me become, you know, helped me love to learn, helped me continue to move on a, a certain path. I, you know, I had this conversation one time with one of my colleagues, um, Richard Martin, who was a history teacher at East Providence High School. And um, we had, we did this whole uh, college conversation on color in the classroom. And we actually had a conversation about when was the first time that each of us had a um, black teacher in the classroom. For me, it wasn't until seventh grade, Miss Judith Smith, who was my English teacher. She was wonderful, but she also validated for me that my people do become teachers. Um, but I had some teachers who, like I said, who really poured into me. So um, this is Mr. Dowd, Mr. Dowd, Charles Dowd. He was a history teacher at Central High School. I really loved history, listening to him. Um, you know, he, he, again, somebody else who just made me really fall in love with history. This is Miss Shirley Cook. She was my 10th grade biology teacher. She made dissecting a pig so much fun. You know, it was so cool. I, I don't think I've enjoyed biology since I've had her. Um, and that was years ago, because again, you know, I told you I graduated in 1971. So yes, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm up there in age. Um, this is Mr. Hamlin, Robert Hamlin. He was my junior year school counselor. He's the one that helped me get that job working as a teacher's assistant. He was absolutely wonderful. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better school counselor during my um, junior year. And this was the love of my life, my senior year. This is Mrs. Rosalind McDonald. She was my senior counselor. And knowing that I was a first generation college student, Mrs. McDonald made sure that when it was time to apply to college, that all the T's were crossed and all the I's were dotted. She walked, you know, students through every, every aspect of applying to college. And it was so much simpler then than it is now. But when you're first generation and that conversation doesn't happen in your household, you needed somebody like a Mrs. McDonald. And Mrs. McDonald and Mr. Hamlin and my seventh grade counselor, who I, God, I wish I had a picture of him, but I don't, Mr. John Gilfillan, really um, are the role models. They're, they're the people that I want to be like when I grow up because they were such fantastic school counselors. And then we have here, this is uh, Catherine A.E. Proper. She was my French teacher in high school. I had her for French, I want to say junior and senior year, maybe longer than that. She was a fantastic teacher. Oh my God. I loved her class. For some reason, I took to French. I just loved the way she taught. And she, and she did such a great job that when I went into my first year in college and took a French class, it was such an easy A because of the teaching that um, she had done, you know, previous years. This is Ann Kane. Ann was Mrs. Kane. I should say Ann. God, uh, Mrs. Kane was my tenth grade English teacher, and what I remember so much about her, and this was really back in the day, you know, when SATs had analogies and vocabulary and all this other stuff. She used to give us twenty five vocabulary words a week that we had to learn. We had to be able to use them in sentences. We had to spell them to cor correctly. We had to define them. We, oh my God, it, it was treacherous, but it really helped us increase our vocabulary. And I, and I just love Mrs. Kane for that. This is Mr. John McAndrew, the late Mrs. Mr. John McAndrew. Um, he was my 11th grade history teacher. And a little story about Mr. McAndrew. He came into our class as our history teacher, probably three months maybe into the school year, maybe a little, you know, somewhere around there. And the reason why he came in when he did is because earlier we had had a different teacher and you know, we were a pretty good class, but she was new. 
It was her first teaching job and she was so nervous. And we kind of took advantage of that. Um, so we used to do like really silly things. I mean, they're so tame compared to the what goes on in some classrooms today. We would do things like, you know, we had her in the afternoon. So we would do things like, okay, one o'clock, everybody drop their books on the floor, you know, just to rattle her, like really, really foolish things. Um, just get up and walk out the room, you know, or or just start talking or, or whatever, but just really like silly to things now that look really um, benign. But back then it was like really crazy. And then one day we just did like really crazy things. We had planned ahead of time to like do this whole thing to really kind of like put her over the edge. So the first person in the first row did this thing where they sat there like they were threading a needle. And she's trying to conduct our, you know, U.S. history class. And so the first person's threading a needle. And and I can't remember if it was a male or a female, but they, take, they took it and acted like they were threading it through the ear and then passed it on to the next person. And it went up and down the rows. When it got to the last row, that person went like this and everybody leaned that way and just sat like that. And she kept saying, stop that. What are you guys doing? We're like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Well, she didn't come back. She did not come back. I think we just kind of like put her over the edge. So we ended up with Mr. McDonald, who was a graduate of Providence College. He came in and he already knew that we had been kind of like crazy acting. And he just let us know that this was not going to happen on his watch. And if you didn't do what you needed to do, then you were going to be after school with him and what have you. So he laid down the law right from the beginning. But one of the things that I loved most about Mr. McDonald is that, Mr. McAndrew, excuse me, is that he, he always looked for ways to make history relevant for us. Um, and and he, he became such a role model for me when I eventually became a history teacher. He's actually the reason why I think I ended up majoring in history. But I remember, you know, we used to have these deep, deep discussions in class and he just made everything so interesting. And I remember one time he said to our class, he said, hey, how would you like to have a day out of school? And we're like, you know, a day out of school, what are you talking about? He goes, well, we're going to go on a field trip and we're going to visit with another high school. And we're like, oh, okay. So that was cool. We were getting out of school for the day. And, you know, we got our permission slips and the whole bit. And so where are we going? Where are we going? He goes, oh, we're going to Coventry High School. So for those of you that are from Rhode Island and you know the state, first of all, we're a really small state, but, um, Coventry, probably still today, Coventry was pretty, was probably 99.999% white. And our class, you know, we were, we were coming from Providence, which is the capital city. We actually were a pretty mixed class, um, but we did have quite a few, you know, black students in, in the class. So we weren't really sure, you know, first it was all fun and games, you know, going on the highway and stuff, going to this school. But then we walked in the front door and immediately felt different. Um, people were coming out of their offices, and I'm talking about adults, were coming out of their offices like staring at us. They were like, okay, like, is something wrong here? Like, did somebody like forget to put their clothes on or what have you? So we still really weren't quite sure. And so Mr. McAndrew had said to us, he goes, well, we're going to talk with this class um, to do like this cross-cultural type thing. So he made it, you know, sound like it wasn't a big deal. But we get in this room and I remember that uh, the room actually had one of those dividers. So they opened up the divider and the room was filled with students from Coventry High School, with faculty and staff from Coventry High School, and everyone was white. And we just started having these, well, they started asking questions. I don't even know how much of a conversation it was. But it was obvious that these students had never been in a room with Black people or all they knew about Black people was what they saw on television. So they were asking us questions like, you know, and at this time, you know, everybody, we all had Afros. They're like, so how do you comb your hair? Like, what kind of food do you eat? What did the inside of your houses look like? I'll never forget one student asked this question. He said, 
So when you take pictures, when you take pictures, how, 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 do, how come they don't just come out black? We're like, what? But he was serious. And we're like, oh my God, you know, you know, they just come out because that's how it is. You know, we were really put on the spot, but it was, it was such a lesson for us. I do remember one of my friends, uh, Vicki Gilliard, who is, who is always outspoken. Um, one young man said, Hey, would you, da- would you date anyone white? And Vicki, you know, she goes, yeah, what are you doing this weekend? He didn't know what to say. He, he didn't expect to hear that. But it was interesting. And I remember the ride back to school, we were pretty quiet because now, you know, we were really thinking about what had taken place. And Mr. McAndrew did such a great job that the rest of the, that week, really debriefing and talking about uh, what we had experienced and related that to different things that we were studying in U.S. history at, at that time. So he, he really piqued my interest in history and in being a history teacher. Um, so to this day, I, I know I owe him so much for that. So remember, your teachers are out there helping you. Moved on to Rhode Island College. Again, see, that history. Uh, got a BA in secondary education um, because I wanted to be a high school history teacher just like Mr. McAndrew. Um, some of the extracurricular activities I did, well, the Harambe Club and a cheerleader. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this, this cheerleading gig. So I had been a cheerleader in high school, as you know. And so my first year at Rick, you know, that, you know, I don't know if you've ever read the book by um, um, Beverly um, Tatum about why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Well, that's how it happened. That's how it was at Rhode Island College. All the black kids sat together in the cafeteria because that's who we were comfortable with. So in the course of the conversation, something came up about tryouts for cheerleading. And I said, oh, when it, when one of those, I would love to try out for cheerleading. I said, you know, I, I cheered a year in high school and people started laughing and I'm like, what's so funny? They said, oh, Rick's, Rick, Rick, um, basketball. They've never had a black cheerleader. I'm like, what? They go, no, nah, we've never had, they've never had a black cheerleader. And I said, oh, okay. So I, Guess I might be the first one. So I went over to the um, gym and this was, this was crazy. You know, this is how we traveled. So, you know, everybody kind of like travel with me. So I went over to the gym to sign up for tryouts. And two of my friends also decided to sign up for tryouts. So we would have to go to practices and watch the routines and learn the routines and what have you. And I, re- and I remember watching some, some of the folks that were current cheerleaders. And I said, uh, <laughs> Not trying to be cocky or anything, but I know I'm better than some of those folks out there. So anyway, tried out, made the squad. Um, my two friends were on as alternates. I, I cheered for a year and I loved the cheering pot. I loved the away games because um, when we went on away games, we got to eat dinner at Twin Oaks. And for those of you that are from Rhode Island, you know, Twin Oaks, you know, the food there. Oh my God, you know, best food, best steaks. Oh, we, we just love Twin Oaks. But after it, but after that first year, I decided I, I didn't want to remain on the cheerleading squad because it was a great activity for me, but socially it was such a bad fit. It was not about me finding my people. It was really awkward being the only black person on the cheerleading squad, even though, you know, half the basketball team was black. It just was not, it was just not my cup of tea. And I just said, nope. I felt so out of place. I felt like, um, you know, I couldn't bring my full self there. Um, it, it, you know, it just, it just was weird. It was, it was like having an out of body experience for me. It was like being in the twilight zone. So I said, you know, that's it. Been there, done that, made the squad, you know, made my point. So I'm, I'm done with that. So went on, you know, again, graduated, um, went on and became a social studies teacher, started first at Edward R. Martin Middle School in East Providence. I only worked the whole time I was a teacher. I only worked in the East Providence School District. So I have such fond memories of that. And I'm just so glad that I had the opportunity to be in there. Um, so Michelle asked, um, so Michelle has a question. Yes. 
It put you in a boxed in feeling. Yes, it did, Michelle. I just felt, I just felt so uncomfortable. I felt like the conversations had nothing to do with me. Uh, when folks were talking about, um, you know, what kind of shampoo or conditioner they were using for their hair and how, and this and that, you know, and I'm sitting there with my Afro and I'm like, okay, that's not working for me. Or when they're talking about um, tanning and what have you. Yeah. Well, I got a permanent tan. So that, that, that conversation wasn't quite happening. And, and, you know, so it was just really, I'm like, this is, this is not, yeah, this just isn't working. So I went on and became a social studies teacher at, um, first, actually, I started at the high school first, East Providence High School, um, but then there was a, a, a reduction in student enrollment. So uh, several of us had to go to um, the, one of the middle schools. So, you know, I was one of the people with least seniority. So two of us, my, my colleague and I, Bill, Billy Flanagan and I were transferred down to the middle school because that's that's how it felt like nobody wanted to work at the middle school. Actually, it was junior high then, so it was seventh to ninth. Um, so we ended up going there and I was teaching geography. I'm like, oh my God, geography, are you like kidding me? I said, I can't wait to like get out of this school. I ended up staying at the middle school for 16, 17 years, I loved my seventh graders. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you can teach middle school, junior high, you can do anything because those kids are walking hormones. One day they're, you know, sophisticated and mature. And the next minute they're acting like they're three years old and throwing tantrums, but they were amazing. I, I loved my years there. Um, Again, like I said, I taught geography. I was a huge fan of Michael Jordan. That's when he was still playing, um, was playing with the Bulls. So you'll see in my classroom, I had all these Michael Jordan posters up. And here's the thing. I don't know if you know this, but Michael Jordan has a degree in geography. Yes, that's what his degree is in. So that's why... Um, his his pictures up there. And this uh, Malcolm X poster, I still have to this day. Actually, I was looking at it the other day and I said, I need to frame it and put it up somewhere because I just, I just had been learning more and more about Malcolm X. And I just love that uh, Cody has on there. I think that's the one that says education is the passport uh, for uh, people who prepare, who prepare for it today. Um, you can see me here at my little basketball shirt on. Again, geography teacher. So always buying t-shirts. So of course, you know, this is me in front of the Capitol building um, during a trip to DC to do some, um, to do some professional development and for a family vacation. So of course I had on my, my geography t-shirt and this was one of my great colleagues, uh, Frank Chen. He was the math teacher. We worked in teams at our middle school, at our junior high. So he was the seventh grade math teacher and I was the seventh grade um, social studies geography teacher. So in our rooms were right next door to each other and I just love being with him. So Kim has a question. Let me see, let's see. So first she's asking, um, how do I feel about traditional and non-traditional pathways for students entering college and do I feel that non-traditional students have a better advantage enrolling later in college versus those who immediately go after high school? You know, Kim, you know, I firmly believe that college may not be for everyone. So even though my focus is on working with students who are college bound, I certainly through my years as a high school counselor worked with a lot of students who um, college was not in their future. It wasn't what they were interested in. Um, they had ideas of what they wanted to do. Um, so I think for some students, it they do much better going out into the workforce and then going to college because, you know, they really have no idea what they want to do. And rather than waste that money, I was just talking with someone the other day who was talking about um, their child uh, a friend, a, a, the child of a friend of theirs who was just wasting money and had like, you know, a 
I don't know, 1.7, 1.8 GPA and was not interested in school at all. And, and the mom said, we're pulling this student out of school. Uh, let the student work for a while, figure out what it is they want to do, and, and then they can go back to school. Um, so it actually, that's what that's what they ended up doing. So I, I have friends who um, didn't go to college right out of high school who went in later years. Um, one of the students that I had uh, when I worked at Providence College um, last year, um, who, who is actually finishing up a degree as a school counselor, he, he, worked, he was in the military for what, 10 years? He was in the military, then he got out and he, and he was working in some college access programs. But he said, if he had gone to college straight out of high school, it would have been a disaster. It would have been an absolute disaster. So he so he did not do that. And he's so much better now as a counselor um, and, and helping students. And um, Desi says, you know, that uh, as a non-traditional student, felt he was more successful when he attended later, went at 29 years old. And that's great. And I think it's so important that people hear that because we get so focused on, oh, what are you going to do? What do you, you know, everybody's going to college. And then I hear kids talk, oh, I know they have no desire to go to college right away, thinking they have to go because that's what they hear their friends saying. So, you know, at, at um, I also work at the Montessori School at Raleigh. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But out of my seniors there, one of my seniors is not going on to college. He um, enjoys um professional dancing and what have you, and has been doing it and taking lessons for a number of years. So he really wants to pursue what that looks like for him. And it's and it's the best thing for him and his family so supportive. And I'm so glad that they are because he's not being forced into doing something that he has absolutely no interest in. And he said, you know, I may do that for a year or two and it might not work out, but that's what I want to do. Right now, I, I don't feel the need to go into college. So again, oh, I love this, Kim. Another segment to introduce non-traditional completers, share their story. I love that, Kim. Yes, I love that. So if you know of someone, you know, send them my way, give them my information. And I, I would love to do that because I think it is important for people to hear that because everyone thinks that there's one way to do things and there's not. I used to hate so much at the end of our... Um, years when I became a school counselor, it used to be, we had to always give a final report. How many students were going to four-year college, two-year college, who was going into the military, who was going directly to employment. So those numbers always look great, but you know what used to really tick me off? We'd come back to school and like somewhere around Christmas vacation, Thanksgiving vacation, we'd start hearing from other students who would tell us that we'd ask about, oh, so-and-so dropped out of school or they're not going to college or they're not doing this. So I, I used to ask, is there any way we can do a follow-up survey? Like what's going on with our kids six months out of after graduation? What's happening 18 months after graduation? And there actually was a company that did that, but our school did not want to pay the money to do it. So I was really upset about that. I said, okay, all we're doing is getting them out of high school. But what are we doing to help them when they go on to college, stay in college and graduate? I said, it, it's more than just let's graduate these kids from high school. What, how, what kind of future are we preparing them for? So again, I, I think it's so good that um, there are more opportunities out there for students and, and there are more certificate programs. And I just wish there was stronger apprenticeship programs in this country. Um, so that we could do that. And Kim is volunteering. So, all right, Kim, I will definitely be looking forward to um, to connecting with you to do this. Yes. So let's continue on my little journey here. So one of the things I always, I talk to my kids about all the time um, is as they are, if they are thinking about looking for a particular career or profession, to also just get more information about that career through the professional associations. I think it's so important that adults join their professional associations or, or have some kind of connection with their, um, their professional associations. And 
So when I was teaching geography, one of the ones I belonged to was the Rhode Island Geography Education Alliance. This was a fantastic organization. We were actually affiliated with National Geographic. So we had a lot of great things that, that came our way. Um, these two pictures, the horse and the tent. So our two coordinators were both, um, one actually was a uh, geography professor at Rhode Island College and the other worked um, in the education department. And they decided that we were going to celebrate, I think it was the 100th, 150th, I think that's what it was, of the, of the Oregon Trail, of the opening. So we were going to rough it on the Oregon Trail. And we're like, oh, my God. So this is us, my friend uh, Val Lawson. So those of you that live in Rhode Island, you might recognize Val. She's now the state senator. Uh, we were both uh, history teachers at the same time. So we had to cross the Oregon Trail and we had to rough it. Now, I am, I'm not an outdoors person. I had never been going outside. But again, I'm always telling my kids, get out of your comfort zone. So in, in doing this, we had to we had different modes of transportation while we were on this trail. I mean, and we were really roughing it. Um, we could walk or we could, there was a wagon, like an old Conestoga wagon. We could do that. Or we could ride the horse. Now, I'm not a horse person and Val and I didn't really want to uh, ride the horses. So we decided, so one day we did the wagon, but we didn't really like that. So we just said, we're just going to walk. And we walked, I forgot how many miles every day. I actually have a map of the trail that we walked on. But what started happening was that some of the other folks that were on this trip with us um, started getting, they needed to ride in the wagon. I mean, they just got tired out. It was too strenuous for them. But they had all these horses and they needed somebody to ride the horses. So because Val and I seemed to be, you know, two of the hardier people on, on the trip, we had to ride the horses. I was like, oh, I don't want to get on this horse. I don't want to get on this horse. But we got on the horses anyway. And, you know, we're, you know, fording these small rivers on the horses and stuff like that. But it was really interesting. We had to, you know, pitch our tents every day. Um you, you had to, you know, roll. I mean, we were laying on the ground. I mean, there were times we were sleeping on top of cow dung. I mean, it was like crazy. Probably the weirdest thing, um, as you notice, there, there are no outdoor facilities here. So we had to learn how to build what they call a split trench. So this is this rectangular opening in the ground and you put up this little triangular covering and stuff. And um, those were the outdoor facilities. And you had to make sure you use the shovel. It was really interesting. And we and we actually had, uh, you know, a, a cook wagon. So there would be meals at the end of the trip um, at the end at the end of the day. You know, you couldn't um, we washed up in, you know, a little pan. You couldn't put, put soap and stuff into the water. It was a really pristine area. It was absolutely gorgeous. But it, it was really interesting. And this was another trip. I can't remember what they had us doing, but I am not a water person either. And they had me out there in this canoe. I was like scared to death doing this. But again, moving out of my comfort zone. Um, so Kim is saying that training is training no matter how you receive it. That is so true, Kim, whether it's an apprenticeship, on-the-job training, work-based learning, volunteering. Yes, yes, yes. I do agree with you so much on that, Kim. And I know with your background working in career development um, and workforce development, you know that more than I do. Ah, Desi, this is so nice. Talking about you talked with the um, head of the school counseling program at PC. Yes, that is um, Dr. Patricia Naylor, who has been. Oh my God, we've been friends like seems like forever. Um, and you grew up around the corner from me. Oh, oh, okay, all right. So that is interesting. I, see, I'm telling you telling you, Rhode Island is like, you know, two and a half degrees of separation instead of six, like everybody talks about. So it was, you know, so again, I, I think it's so important that students belong to professional associations and, and get involved. In between that and starting, you know, I went back to school um, at Rhode Island College, got a master's in school counseling. I, you know, I was looking around, I have no pictures from this time. I know that when it was time for graduation, I was like, 
two weeks away from delivering my first son. So I did not go to graduation because I was huge and there was no way I was marching in that um, graduation lineup the way I looked. It just, it wasn't happening. But I ended up, it took me a while to do, get my master's because I ended up, um, I, I ended up like just, what did I, oh, I know what it was. I was only taking like one class a semester. I was dragging it out because in Rhode Island at the time, if you had a teaching certificate, you also had to either get additional credits after five years or a master's degree. And I figured if I'm going to take all these credits anyway, I want to make sure it's it's a master's degree. And I remember Mr. Gilfillan and Miss, Mr. Hamlin and Mrs. McDonald. And I said, oh yeah, I am definitely going to make sure that um, I go into school counseling. Oh, Desi. Oh my God. Desi Weaving. Oh Lord. Yes. <laughs> Whoa. That is definitely, oh my God. Okay, folks, you're probably saying, what is she talking about? But the Whedons lived around the corner from me when I lived in East Providence. And um, my kids grew up with most of them. Actually, my youngest son is the godfather to um, Brandon Whedon's kids. And oh my God, I just love Rhode Island. And I just, I just miss it so much because it's all these little connections that we have here. Then I went on, you know, I was, Ended up going back to East Providence High School after 17 years, 16, 17 years at the middle school. Um, after a while, and we didn't have IDs at first, but then they started getting IDs. So these are just some of my pictures. I was looking at this one from, uh, I said, oh my God, look how fat my face is there. Jeez. You know, so these are just, you know, our IDs. And um, when, on, you know, when I first went back to the high school, I was teaching history. And then... Uh, um, a position came open for school counselors and school counseling, school counseling positions at the high school are few and far between. So I knew if I didn't apply for it then that most likely another one wouldn't open up anytime soon. So I applied for it um, and I actually didn't get that first one, but then another one opened up. And I ended up getting that one um, because everything is done by seniority. Well, it was then. I'm not sure what it looks like now, but it was all seniority. So the person who had applied before me had more seniority than I did. So they just kind of like automatically got the job. And then I um, got the next position that was open. Um, and, I, and I always, even now, I always tell folks, you know, it's important to have a um, business card. And that wasn't something that was common back in the day for school counselors or for teachers. So, you know, in our little, you know, little, little computers and stuff that we had back in the day, I made up my, my business card so I could pass it out to people and, and let them know who, who we were. Um, this is really particularly, um, I love this picture. So this young lady, this is Claudine, um, Claudine Miles is, is her name now. Her name was Claudine Varela. Back in the day, I was her um, high school counselor. It, I was looking at this and all these papers and the desk. My desk still looks like that today. It is so messy. Oh my God, I cannot get rid of paper. Um, Claudine is, um, she, she, she went on to become an educator, but she is now um, an entrepreneur and she's the owner of a company, a business called Restore More, where she works with schools around restorative justice. And so she trains teachers and communities and parents and what have you. She lives in the Atlanta area. I am just so proud of her. But I remember this day I was kind of like fussing at her because this was her senior year and she was kind of like, you know, getting lazy. Um, and I, and I was fortunate. Um, I had, um, been named, um, the Rhode Island School Counselor of the Year that year. So the Providence Journal had uh, was came in to do a story on me. And it was funny because the day that uh, report it came in, I was in the office with um, Claudine. So so that kind of that kind of ended up being one of those stories. Um, so these are just some of the things I got to do as a counselor. I loved being a school counselor. I love, love, love being a school counselor. Um, getting, you know, getting involved with the students in all, oops, in all types of ways, excuse me. Um, this was actually a signs of suicide program that we were doing in conjunction that, um, Congressman Patrick Kennedy was, um, the sponsor of, and we had brought it to our high school. I had connected with his office somehow, 
And that's, and that's one of the things that we were doing. This, um, I got to be the advisor for our multicultural club at the school. So again, when you're a teacher, when you're involved with the school, it's it's more than just being in the classroom or, or what have you. It's, it's doing all those other things. This is one of my favorite pictures. So um, I always went to the prom. I was always a chaperone at the prom. And this young lady had, um, and I was also the counselor for all our ESL students, all our English as a second language students, as they will call then, as the, as the students will call then. And this young lady, I mean, she had, she had a pretty rough life and things were a little, little tough for her. And um, I remember she wanted to go to the prom, but the funds just weren't there and it just wasn't happening. And I remember having the conversation about, well, why aren't you going? And, you know, and as we kept talking, it, it came out, you know, her, her dad didn't feel that that was money that he wanted to spend or to help her go. And this this was one of her, her good friends in the class. And I said, do you really want to go to the prom? She goes, yes, but I, I don't have the money to go and I can't pay for a dress. Well, I have two sons. So I just decided, hmm, I'm just going to throw my hat in the ring here. So I offered, I said, hey, let's go prom dress shopping. Because I knew I wasn't going to get to do it anytime soon, not, not with two sons. So that's what we did. And this is the dress she picked up. Now, I do have to say, I said, you know, go ahead. I mean, we went to, I don't know how many stores on the mall and stuff looking, looking at dresses. And then when she said, I, she tried this one on and she goes, I love this dress. I said, okay, that's the dress. And then I looked at the price. I'm like, oh my God. But she looked beautiful in it, bought the prom tickets. She went to the prom, had a fantastic time. And, you know, those are just the kinds of things that you get to do as a school counselor. This is a Katie Deschen. Um, This was at graduation, at one of the graduations. So, you know, teachers always work the graduations. And again, my messy office, my um, Malcolm X poster following me, my super messy office. Oh, my God, my offices are always such a mess. If you could see the stuff around me right now, and it still looks the same. It's terrible. Um I am, a, again, a firm believer in professional development and belonging to your professional organization. So I was a member of the Rhode Island School Counselor Association, and I decided I wanted to be part of the leadership team. So I ended up um, running or was elected to, um, to office. So one of the things we had to do with when you were the president-elect, you had to go to an institute called the Leadership Development Institute. And we were actually at Furman University and we had, um, oh, four or five days of what have you of leadership training. So this was my class. Well, these were some of the members of my class at the LDI. And this is um, a group of some of us as we were being officially oriented at ASCA into becoming, we were, t we were taking over as president of our state association. So, you know, there were all state presidents. So I was the state president from Rhode Island and again, love having business cards. So this was my time working um, as a leader at RISCA. And once I, my uh, time from past president, I still was on the board and, and what have you, um, you know, and, and doing that, it's still kind of involved with them every now and then, you know, sometimes. And then lo and behold, uh, this, this was, this was amazing. Uh, Rhode Island school council of the year. So every year, every state has a, has a school council of the year. The way this takes place is people, um, there's a name, you know, there's, a, there's a name that's the names are given to the board and what have you. And, and they, and they reach out and they choose someone, but it's the person doesn't know that they're being chosen. They have no idea. So they reach out to, oh, colleagues, fellow teachers, fellow counselors, students, parents, what have you, to write letters of recommendation. So this is really a peer, um, a peer award. Now, here's the weird thing. The year of this, I was uh, I was on, you know, so many committees and Part of my job was to get the plaques 
for whoever was the school counselor of the year because someone in uh, one of the um, teachers in our school, his side hustle was he created plaques and trophies. So they gave me the name and actually it was um, Barbara Crudale who was still a really good friend of mine. She's the uh, director of guidance at South Kingstown High School in Rhode Island. So they told me Barbara was the school counselor of the year. I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. So I go and I talk to Jimmy and I said, Jimmy, this is the name for the plaque and blah, blah, blah. So he gets it together and he, and he, and he brings in like a, a, a sample, a draft of it to show me what it looks like. I said, oh my God, this is wonderful. So now we get to the part in the program where they're getting ready to introduce. And I'm looking over at Barbara because I can't wait to see her face when they announce her name. And I remember just prior to this, um, my principal walked in, um, the superintendent walked in, a couple other people. I'm like, oh, this is nice. We have people from our school that, you know, are coming to see what the school counselors conference is all about. So I remember I, I'm looking over at Barbara because I'm waiting because I know they're going to call her name because they're doing this whole like spiel. But then I happened to look over to my right. And I saw my sons in the, in the doorway and I'm like, why are they here? Couldn't believe it. So this is heartbeat number two, the youngest one. And this is heartbeat number one. They look a lot different now. His dreads are now like kind of like down to here now. Um, they probably kill me showing this picture. And it's so funny because I think this is one of the few pictures I have um, from this event. Um, and I said, what are they doing here? And and then my name was called. I was like astounded. But what's but what's even what's even better is um every now and then when I'm feeling like, oh man, am I like doing my job right? And and you know, when you have those self-doubts going on, I still have the booklet of letters and recommendations from students and parents and colleagues and what have you. And that just always kind of like makes me feel like so good. Then I actually was recruited from Providence by Providence College to come in. Oh, I need to speed this up because I'm gonna become more than an hour. Um, they had a Providence College had the opportunity to um work with the Rhode Island Department of Education in a grant funded program. So they had a program called the Rhode Island School Counseling Project and they needed someone to run it, coordinate it, whatever. So the, you know, the title was counselor in residence. So I was recruited by um, Providence College to run this program and it was supposed to be for one year. So I was supposed to take a sabbatical for my high school for one year. It ended up being for six years. This this job is the one that really allowed me to use all the skills and knowledge and talents that I had acquired over the years without having someone tell me how to do my job. Complete autonomy to do this work. So my position was to do professional development for the school counselors statewide in Rhode Island, to sit on any education committees, um, as the school council representative. Um, and then I also, as you can see here, my, my um, ID, I also taught the career information class to school counselors, to people who were preparing to be school counselors. So I did that for a number of years. So for six years, I, I got to work at Providence College in the, in the Office of Graduate Studies. Actually, by the time I left, it was the Office of Professional Studies. Love that, love that, love that here. I'm doing some training with some, uh, with, um, Peggy and Hilda from the Education Trust. So they had a program, um, Transforming School Counseling. So I was part of that program. And then because of some of the work that I was doing, I, I was fortunate enough to be on it again um, with the ASCA, which is the American School Counselor Association, the Council Director Coordinator of the Year in 2007. And again, this is a peer um it's a national, it's, it's a net. Well, they don't do it anymore. They just, they just, they have a, they changed the um, format of it, but this was fantastic. I mean, this, this was so good. And I had the opportunity. So the gala was in, uh, where were we? We were in Denver, Denver, Colorado. And these are some of my colleagues that flew out um, to be there with me. This is Barbara Crudale, who is at um, South Kingston High School. Um, Dr. Patricia Naylor, who is now the director of the school counseling program at Providence College. Um, this is Linda Michaelman. Uh, who is this? Diane West, Scott Sutherland, who was a principal. Uh, Carl uh, Squire, who we love to death. Um, Arthur Lisi, Bill Pepin, and Jim Garino. So, you know, 
Those were some of the folks that were there with me when I got the award. Then, you know, I went back to school. I had always promised myself that I was going to get a terminal degree, but it was like, oh, I'm going to do it when I'm 35. Well, I'm going to do it when I'm 40. I'm going to do it when I'm 50. I went back to school when I was 53. And I had talk, kept talking myself out a bit. Finally, um, actually, it was Dr. Naylor who convinced me. She goes, well, you know, because the program was going into a Johnson & Wales. They had, it was designed where you could do it in three years if you, um, if, if you hustled and if you really grinded it out. I said, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm too old. I don't have time. It costs money. I've got kids. I've got a full-time job. And as she said to me, she goes, in three years, you can have the degree or not have the degree. The three years are still going to go by. And I'm like, oh, okay. So needless to say, I went ahead and, and, and did it. I don't remember too much about anything because it was like being in a black hole because it was working full time, doing a full time program, um, had kids at home. Um, thank God my husband kind of like took over all the, all the, all the cleaning duties and stuff, but it was pretty good. Moved. Actually, the year after the year I, I got my um, doctorate in 2010, moved to North Carolina at the end of that year and really had to reinvent myself, did not know what I was going to do. But I ended up um, going to the NAC, a NACAC conference, which is the National Association for College Admission Counseling, went to a session where I learned about um, independent educational consulting, decided that that's what I wanted to do and um, became an IEC. Started my company in 2011, Steps to the Future, and actually some of my friends uh, came up with the name for me. I said, here, here, are like, you know, pick out some names for me. I don't know. So some of my friends back in Rhode Island came up with this name. Um, my very first website was actually designed by one of my uh, former high school students who went on to do um, that type of work, who went on to become a graphic designer. She, does, she designed my first website, um, Sarah Johnson, and then um, it's now Sarah Mendes. And then um, Seneca Yearwood designed my first website, a uh, former student. So it was great. That was nice to those students. Um, became a member of um, IECA. Again, I told you I'm, I'm all about belonging to your professional associations. This is just me at one of my vendor events um, back in the day when you could like go out and do those safely. I'm not you know, doing those anymore. But decided that this was the path for me. And again, still thinking, still believing strongly in professional development and community service. So this is just a small smattering of some of the things I've done. Um, I used to do, before COVID, do workshops at the different branches of our library and other organizations. So this is me doing one, um, doing a workshop for the Vision Resource Center um, on preparing for college, uh, always learning about colleges in different formats. So this was, I had attended a luncheon that was held in, um, in Raleigh or either Durham. And this is the outgoing president of the University of Richmond. Actually, I think this is his last year. Um, so of course I wanted to get a picture with him. Um, one of the things we do as consultants is visiting colleges. Haven't done a lot of that because of COVID, but hoping to get back. So this is um, visiting, um, this is actually at UCLA. You see that, the Bruin Bear. I'm not quite sure where I am with this one. I have to figure that one out. But one of my other great loves is um, the library. For those of you that know me, you know I love reading, love books. Um, I served, I just finished my term on the Board of Trustees for the Cumberland County Public Library, um, just rolled off um, December um, and served two years as the um, chair of the Board of Trustees. Um, so uh, um, I miss that. Love it, love it, love it. And actually became, uh, was elected to the um, Board of Directors for the Independent Educational Consultant Association, which is really cool. Um, this is an association that's been around since 1976. and um, you know, representation matters. I am the first black person on the board. Um, took a while, but here we go again, you know, breaking those barriers. And this is just, you know, different um, name tags from different professional development conferences and workshops and what 
have you. That's just a smattering of them that I went to over the years. And as I wrap this up, I'm also the college counselor at the Montessori School of Raleigh. I've been there since January 2019. So I work with their uh, students on, again, the college admission process and getting college readiness and what have you. And I'm also a community partner with Fayetteville State University's Gear Up program. So one of the things I do with them is to help them with um, parent programming. So they have an annual conference call for the love of children. So I always present there to parents. And we are actually working on a um, six month program where I will do a monthly workshop for parents, hopefully starting this month. Um, or, so, you know, parents need this information also. So that's part of what I do. And whoops, here we go here. And that's me. That's Dr. B. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, here's my email. This is my website. Um, I... I distribute a monthly newsletter. So if you're interested in the newsletter, here is the link to do so. And I also have a YouTube channel. So this is playing on my Facebook page and it's also playing on my YouTube channel. And then there are also a few other videos that I've uploaded on my YouTube channel that didn't necessarily go live. So again, and these are my babies. So those of you that know me, I love my fur babies. This is Cassius who is now nine. This is Zeben, who is um, almost six. Uh, this is uh, Polly Peanut, who is 15. And this is Grace. Grace, I think, is seven or eight. I'm not even sure. I have to look. Um, but again, that's me, Dr. B. And um, I just figured this was a chance for me to give people a little bit more information about me who I am, how I came to do the work that I'm doing. So you can see that I've been in education for more than 40 years. Love it, love it, love it. Will never stop. But the other thing I need to do, because you know me, a book. So recently, Bonds and Nobles had this 50% off sale. And I want to say it was a couple of days after Christmas. So like three or four days they had this. And of course, I know someone that works there, so she let me know. And I had to run out and like stock up on books. Like God knows I needed more books in the house. And this one's just caught my eye. It's called Collective Wisdom, Lessons, Inspiration, and Advice from Women Over 50. The title right there, I said, okay, I need to get this book because I am definitely over 50. And I needed to see what I could learn from some of these women. And just looking at, uh, you know, some of the things that I love, I haven't started this one yet because I've got another one that I'm reading right now. And, you know, this one, you know, they have all these great quotes in there along with stories about people. And this one, like when one door closes, another one opens. And if it doesn't, build one yourself. That's what I had to do with this business. When I moved here, I really thought that I was going to get hired by one of the colleges, colleges either as an academic advisor or, or a career advisor. And after 35, 36 applications, I didn't have a job. So you know what? Built one myself. So again, this is a great book, Collective Wisdom, and it's edited by um, Grace Bonney. So that's the book for today. And I thank you so much. For those of you that watch this live, those of you that are watching this on the replay, thank you so much for um, tuning in and hearing a little bit about my career journey. Um, like I said, being a little self-indulgent, patting myself on the back for some of the work that I've done over the years, because again, we don't sing our praises enough. You know, um, so I so part of my goal for this year is to is is to love on me a little bit more, brag on myself a little bit more, and 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 just um, know that I have value and I bring value to everything that I do. So I thank you so much for being here. And there won't be one next week. There won't be a college and career conversations January tenth because I have another. Um, webinar that I'm actually facilitating. And this is another thing I promised myself that I am not going to overload my schedule. And I'm taking off that superwoman cape and trying to be more reasonable about how I use my time. 
So there won't be a, a college and career conversations on January 10th. And I'm working on the guest list for the rest of this month and in the future. So I hope so much to see you here. And remember, you can always go back and look at um, past college and career conversations either on my Facebook page or you can go on the YouTube channel. And here is the URL for the YouTube channel. And I really thank everyone so much for um, taking time out of your Monday evening to be here because you didn't have to be here. You could have been doing something else. So I really appreciate it and take care everyone and just make sure you continue being kind to everyone. It's so important, you know, in this time, this day and age that we're kind because you never know what somebody is going through. So take care. Goodbye. And I will see you on January 17th, which happens to be Martin Luther King Day. It's also Michelle Obama's birthday and my heartbeat number two's birthday. So take care, everyone, and enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.